Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're finally starting what has been the single most requested series in Kill Count history. Halloween, John Carpenter's 1978 film that ignited the slasher subgenre. As I've said on this show before, Halloween was not the first slasher ever made, but it was the one that captured everyone's imagination. After producer Erwin Yablons came up with the movie's title and a simple premise involving babysitters, co-writers and producers John Carpenter and Deborah Hill set out to make horror history with a laughably small budget of only $320,000, provided by Yablons and the quote-unquote grandfather of Halloween, Mustafa Akkad. There are lots of reasons this movie went so far on so little, from the iconic haunting score composed by Carpenter himself, to the suburban setting that made the audience feel as vulnerable as the victims they were watching, to the memorable performances by a 20-year-old Jamie Lee Curtis and the original Ernst Stavro Blofeld Donald Pleasance. But above all else, Halloween succeeded because of its blank-faced stalker Michael Myers, also known as The Shape. Played by by filmmaker Nick Castle for a measly 25 bucks a day, the man in the modified William Shatner mask terrified audiences and kicked off the first of the horror genre's royal franchises. Over the next couple of months, I'll be covering all of the Halloweens available on home video, meaning 10 installments and 4 different timelines. On October 19th, an 11th film will be released, which will start a 5th timeline for the series. But we'll have to wait for the Blu-ray for it to be on the kill count. Don't worry though, even without that latest installment, we're in for a crazy ride. I'll guide you through the franchise as Sam Loomis becomes a shrieking madman, as Michael's origin becomes tied up in the occult, and all the times that the series tries to reinvent itself, whether that's as a couple of hip millennial horror comedies, a low-class white trash hellbilly saga, or a uh, Irish toy maker selling deadly Halloween masks. But before we get into all that, we gotta go back to Haddonfield, Illinois, and count the kills that started it all. The movie begins with a jack-o'-lantern and a title card! Right away, even the opening credits are iconic, since they're backed by that dope-ass Halloween theme, and because when it zooms in on the pumpkin's eye and nose, it looks like Michael himself holding a knife. Cool! After that, we're in Haddonfield, Illinois, on Halloween night, 1963, in a first-person POV shot similar to the one that opened Black Christmas. The POV shots in Halloween were done with the recently invented Steadicam technology by cinematographer Dean Cundy, who would go on to shoot blockbusters such as the Back to the Future trilogy and Jurassic frickin' park. We watch as our audience surrogate peeps in on a couple making out before they head upstairs for more heavy petting. After a stop at the kitchen drawer where Deborah Hill's hand grabs a butcher knife, the first person view sees the dude putting his shirt back on and leaving the house. It's only been a minute, dude. Was that one of those never happens to me situations? The camera heads upstairs and grabs a clown mask from the floor, obfuscating our view as it walks into the very open bedroom of the topless Judith Myers. Girl, topless hairbrushing is the best, I'm sure, but maybe close the door for it, or else you risk this happening. Michael! Yep, this is Michael Myers' first kill, his older sister Judith, and he's such a noob at murder that he has to keep checking his stabbing form while he kills her. You're doing fine, Mikey, don't worry. When he's done, Judith is left as a topless bloody corpse lying on her bedroom floor. Michael heads back downstairs and out of the house right as his parents pull up. The extended first-person shot finally ends when they demask him and then just, uh, kinda stand there for an awkwardly long time without saying anything or emoting as the camera pulls away. Classic cold open, though. Jump to Smith's Grove in the same state, now 15 years later on Halloween Eve. T'was a dark and stormy night when Dr. Sam Loomis, played by the masterful Donald Pleasance, joined chain-smoking nurse Marion Chambers to go to the Smith's Grove Sanitarium. They're going to pick up Michael Myers, who Loomis keeps referring to as an it, and transfer him to another facility. But things take a turn for the creepy when they see that the Smith's Grove inmates are out and about, getting all wet. Instead of being concerned about them catching hypothermia like a real doctor would, Loomis presses forward and hops out to open the hospital gate. That's when Michael Myers hops on top of Marion's car and grabs her by the face, tormenting her until she flees from her vehicle that he promptly Grand Theft Autos. Michael must have been top of the class in the Smith's Grove driver's ed program. The next day, back in Haddonfield, we meet Lori Strode, a modestly dressed high schooler played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Her Halloween night plans involve babysitting this little kid Tommy Doyle, who's all sorts of scared of the abandoned Myers house. Lori has a key to the place because her dad's a local realtor, but as she leaves it under the mat, she doesn't notice that she's being watched by a shape inside. And a shape outside! Must be one of those interior-exterior shapes. The shape continues its voyeuristic tendencies when Lori's in school, staring at her from behind Nurse Chambers' car parked across the street. But while Lori's busy being an SMRT smart girl, he vanishes into thin air. Which way did he go, Lori? Which way did he go? In Smith's Grove, Dr. Terrence Wynn, a colleague of Loomis's, blames the small doctor for Michael's escape and says it's unlikely that Myers is headed to Haddonfield 150 miles away. Oh, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car! He was doing very well last night! Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. On his way to Haddonfield, 
Haddonfield, Loomis stops at a payphone to warn the Haddonfield police, and that's where he notices a truck on the side of the road. He finds evidence that Michael was there, but runs off before seeing our second body on the kill count, this poor truck driver who Michael apparently killed and stripped for that classic blue jumpsuit. Damn, man, stealing cars and clothes? Michael's just as much a thief as he is a murderer. Lori walks home with her cheerleader friend Linda, played by PJ Souls, who's totally got a problem saying totally all the fucking time. Totally, totally, totally. They're joined by Andy Brackett, played by Nancy Kyes, who credited stage name was, interestingly enough, Nancy Loomis. Michael Myers rolls by in his station wagon at a nice slow stalkery pace, but that doesn't stop Annie, the sheriff's daughter, from playing citizen cop. Hey, jerk! Speed kills! Michael stops his car threateningly, but after a pregnant pause, just keeps on driving. He catches back up with them later on the walk home when he's standing behind a bush staring at Lori and Annie, but when Annie goes to confront him, he's disappeared once again. Michael does that a lot. He does it some more after Lori gets home to her room decorated with smart person stuff. She sees him outside by the clothesline, then somehow, without her gaze ever breaking, he just disappears. That one doesn't make any sense to me, but okay, we get it, he's a creepy stalker. Meanwhile, Dr. Loomis arrives in Haddonfield and goes to the cemetery, only to find that Judith Myers' gravestone has been removed, straight plucked from the ground. She came home. Later that day, Lori gets picked up by Annie, and they're having such a good time smoking a doob and listening to Blue Oyster Cult that they don't notice Michael tailing them in the Myers mobile. He gives them some space when they pull over to talk to Annie's dad, Sheriff Brackett, who's checking out a hardware store burglary that sounds like a very specific hit. All they took was some Halloween masks, a rope, and a couple of knives. <laughs> Wait, why did that hardware store have Halloween masks? Somehow Papa Brackett doesn't smell that dank weed in the car, so he waves the girls goodbye, right before Loomis shows up and introduces himself. Psst, Loomis! Look behind you, dude! The shape you want is right behind you! Night comes, and Sheriff Brackett takes Loomis to the Myers house, where it all went down 15 years ago. They find a dead dog off screen, the first of many, many pooches that Michael Myers will kill throughout the series. He got hungry. And, uh, eat? Did he eat that dog corpse, or is that a metaphor, Loomy? During a tour of the house, Donald Pleasance gets to capital A act when he tells Brackett about Michael's psychiatric history. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes the devil's eyes. Yeah, it's some good acting. Now that it's nighttime, the teens of Haddonfield are out to make some babysitting bucks. Michael silently observes Annie as she gets to the house she's watching over, the Wallace family home, while just across the street at Tommy Doyle's house, Lori is already nice and cozy, shitting all over Tommy's taste in comic books. Annie calls Lori to tell her that she's arranged a date with our virginal final girl with a dude she's into named Ben Tramer. Pretty much every scene with Lori and her friends involves them telling her she needs to get laid, but I wanted to mention this combo in particular just because Ben Tramer comes back in a hilarious way next movie. Tommy looks out the window and sees the shape standing outside the Wallace home, but when he gets Lori to look, Mike's pulled his disappearing act again. Turns out he's gone around back to watch Annie take her shirt off after she spilled some butter on it. While he's peeping in, the Wallace family dog Lester comes across him and starts growling. Michael makes short work of the poor canine and kills him, but in case you're new here, I only put humanoids on the kill count. Sorry, Lester. Annie gets a call from her boyfriend Paul saying that his parents are gone and that it's bone o'clock, so she takes little Lindsay Wallace across the street to drop her off off with Lori and Tommy. The kids immediately get to watching The Thing from Another World, a fun inclusion in hindsight since Carpenter would go on to make his own version of The Thing just four years later, which is still the best horror movie ever made. Come at me. Lori agrees to watch over Andy's charge while Andy takes a visit to Pound Town. The old Girl Scout comes through again. Andy never gets to fulfill her teenage desires though, because after she gets in the car to go pick up El Jerko, she's attacked by Michael Myers from the back seat. He strangles her in a lengthy silent scene with no noise except for his heavy breathing and the sounds of her struggle until she finally starts blaring the car horn in an effort to attract some help. That's when Michael cuts the kill short with a butcher knife, slitting her throat as Annie Brackett becomes the third member of our kill count. Michael may be good at killing discreetly, but he's got to work on his body disposal, since Tommy sees him from the window carrying that corpse under a bright porch light. Props for being able to open that door with no hands though, Mikey. You'd be great at one of those grocery delivery service jobs. In case you were having some unpleasant withdrawals from a lack of Loomis, we get a fun little scene wherein he scares some kids that had bullied Tommy earlier. They're outside the Myers house, daring each other to go touch it like friggin' Boo Radley lives there, when Loomis overhears their names and fucks with them. Hey, Lonnie. 
get your ass away from there. <laughs> Loomis is kind of a dick to kids. I love it. But sorry, back to horny teenagers. Linda and her boyfriend Bob roll up to the Wallace house so they can bang there while Annie keeps little Lindsay distracted. Of course, neither Annie nor Lindsay are home right now. It's totally dark. So they're content to just make out on a stranger's couch, way too distracted to see the shape standing mere feet away watching them. Later on, they call up Lori, who tells them that little Lindsay is gone for the night, so they escalate their debasement of the Wallace home to full-on fucking in the parents' bed. Also, is that a real pumpkin jack-o'-lantern on the nightstand? Who does that? They have an unusually short sex session, after which Linda is totally lying when she says it was fantastic, and then she sends Bob off to get her a beer. As he leaves, he breaks one of Randy Meeks' cardinal rules for surviving a horror movie. I'll be right back. After Bob grabs the beer, we get one of the best scenes of the movie when Michael pops out of a closet and starts choking Bob against the wall. It's a pretty solid jump scare, and the kill is Michael's finest in the film, as he lifts Bob up off the ground with a single hand and then uses his other hand to stab Bob with his butcher knife. The icing on top, though, is that when Michael removes his hand, Bob's feet stay elevated off the ground. Michael stares at the new wall decoration with a couple of head tilts, showing he can appreciate his murder art from multiple angles. Linda Vanderklok is our next hapless victim, and Michael dresses up for the occasion. It's Ghost Bob Michael Myers, and it's probably my favorite image from the movie. It's followed by what's probably many other people's favorite image from the movie, as Linda tries to seduce Bob out of his Halloween spirit. See anything you like? After Ghost Bob is totally unresponsive, Linda goes to call Lori, but as soon as Lori answers, Linda is attacked by Michael, who strangles her with the phone cord. Lori hears the noises over the phone, first assuming it's some kind of sex noise prank, but to her credit, she does become concerned by the time Linda is totally down and out for another kill on the count. After she's dead, Michael's all like, new phone, who dis? But Lori hangs up on it. Boring conversation anyway. And back to Dr. Loomis, who inexplicably just now sees that Marion Chambers' station wagon is parked across the street. <laughs> Maybe you would have noticed it earlier if you weren't too busy cussing out the neighborhood kids, Loomis. But now that he knows Michael's in town, he's on the move. Concerned about that moany phone call from the Wallace home, Lori heads across the street to check on Annie and Linda. It's completely dark inside, and after she heads upstairs, she follows the only light on into the bedroom, where she gets to kick off her final girl circuit by finding Annie's body splayed out on the bed in front of Judith Myers' gravestone. And as with any true final girl circuit, she finds the other bodies in unlikely ways, with Bob swinging down from the ceiling somehow, and a cabinet door opening on its own to reveal PJ Souls doing a pretty goofy dead body face. The corpses scare Lori out into the hallway, Way, where, in a very cool shot, the shape materializes from the shadows behind her. He steps out and stabs at her shoulder, raising her with a slash that sends her over the banister and crashing to the bottom of the staircase. One of the most infamous horror movie chase scenes begins, as Lori tries to escape through all these locations that the movie has done a great job setting up, so you know the exact physical layout of them. I think it's one of the undervalued geniuses of this movie. Lori gets back to the Doyle house and is locked out as Michael slowly makes his way across the street towards her. When Tommy finally lets her in, she barks at him to go hide upstairs. Stairs. Do as I say! With the lights off and the phone line dead, Lori hunkers down and grabs a knitting needle. Michael appears behind her, having come through the window, but when he misses an easy strike with his knife, she's able to stab him in the neck with the needle, which gets him down to the ground. But Lori's a Gen 1 final girl who doesn't know the way this shit works, so she assumes that a single stab has put her tormentor out of business for good. She goes upstairs to tell the kids that it's over and that she killed him, but Tommy knows better. You can't kill the boogeyman. Tommy's right. Michael's back, baby! Lori ushers the kids into one room and goes into another, where she hides in the closet. Michael follows, and we get another classic scene as he violently shakes the closet door for a while before punching through it and turning on the light. It's a good thing Lori never listened to her mommy dearest, though, and has a wire hanger at her disposal, which she turns into a weapon and then uses to stab Michael Myers right in the eye. Michael drops his knife, and she presses on with the attack, stabbing him in the chest with it. This knocks him out again, and gives Lori another false sense of security as she leaves the comfort of the closet. Once again, she consults the children, and tells them to go down the street to a neighbor's house and call the police. After she sends them off, she she sits there catching her breath, and doesn't notice when behind her, Michael single-handedly pioneers a new workout program. Horror killer abs. Get that six-pack in ten movies or less, one sit-up at a time. The kids run out the front door screaming bloody murder, and since Loomis happens to be walking by, he puts two and two together and heads towards the house. Good thing, too, since Michael has made his way over to Lori and starts strangling her with his bare hands. Right as Loomis runs upstairs, Lori pulls off Michael's mask, giving us a fleeting glimpse of the very plain-looking face of evil in a shot where Michael was played by a dude named Tony Moran. Loomis fires his gun at Michael, then follows through and shoots him five more damn times with his gun, sending the spree killer out onto the back balcony and over the rally, where he lies on the ground in defeat. After the gun smoke has cleared, Lori gets a debriefing from Loomis. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, 
It was. Michael's boogeyman credentials are sealed when Loomis looks outside to find that Michael Myers is missing. The bastard somehow survived and is free to kill once more. The movie ends expertly with a montage of all the locations we've seen, as Michael's heavy breathing grows louder and louder, suggesting that nowhere in Haddonfield is safe from the shape. It's a good thing Michael brushed himself off to kill again, because his initial body count is pretty weak. Here, I'll show you at the numbers. Only five people died in Halloween, but that's fine for a first outing. It leaves room for growth. The victims consisted of two guys and three gals, giving the ladies the edge in this pumpkin pie chart. With a runtime of 91 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average every 18.2 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Bob. The shot of him pinned to the wall is one of the best shots in the movie, and the head tilt that Michael does tells us everything we need to know about it. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to the trucker, whose body wasn't even found by anyone but the audience. Poor dude. And that's it. Halloween came out in 1978 and ignited a brush fire of slashers, and eventually its own lengthy series of sequels. We'll look at the first of those, Halloween 2, next week. But until then, I'm James Agenese. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Stephen William Swanberg, Gage Hill, and Seth Vermillion. And an extra special thanks to Romulus Fane. We're finally doing Halloween. It's probably my least favorite of the Big Three series. But this first movie may be the best movie out of all of them. It's such good filmmaking, man. You know, like film it like it's, it's like art, man. Fucking art. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.